Thank you, uh, General Conway. We have provided such good live TV for all of our viewers. We've had congressmen pulled out, congressmen standing on the steps of the of the of the of the house, and some that don't show up. So it's all it's all great. Well, we're up to our next panel. I don't know if we're going to call uh, everyone up here, uh, Greg. Perfect. That's exciting. Our Brady Bunch look. So this is the view from industry, and we've got such a great panel. I'm joined here by Andy Leland, Head of Strategic Advisory for Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Benchmark has really uh, taken the world in Washington by storm by being the vocal uh, number crunchers around the world about uh, mineral and battery uh, production. So we're very excited to hear from Andy. Edwin Olson, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of May Mobility. Uh, Ed uh, founded May in January 2017. The operates 25 electric autonomous shuttles in three cities. And to date, May Mobility has logged over 250,000 revenue generating miles. Ed participated in the famous DARPA Grand Challenge, which you heard about from Dan Jurgen, uh, when he was a student at MIT. Uh, Ryan Popple is the co-founder and executive director of Proterra, which is the leading innovator of zero emission battery electric buses in the United States. He was an early employee of Tesla and a member of Kleiner Perkins, and he no notably served our country in the U.S. Army. And finally, Michael Stumo, CEO of Coalition for a Prosperous America, uh, CPA, Coalition for a Prosperous America, is a national organization working on policies to balance U.S. trade, uh, create jobs, achieve broadly shared prosperity. CPA represents 4.1 million households through its associations and company members in agriculture, manufacturing, and labor. Thank you all for uh, joining us uh, here today. It's really appreciate it. Why don't we start with uh, Michael? You know, we heard from Dan Jurgen before in his book that he talks about a new Cold War with China. It's focused on EVs, new energy technology. Maybe can you give us some perspective on China's whole of government approach, which has been mentioned several times, and how they use that to compete, and why you believe industrial strategy is actually an important component for the United States when competing with China? Sure. Thanks, Robbie. It's a great program here. Uh, China's whole of, of government approach is because uh, it's by nature, they're a state managed uh, economy. It's not state capitalism. It's not a reasonable facsimile of our capitalist model. It is a state managed economy. Prices don't matter. Um, uh, you know, costs don't matter if something is directed to be done. Uh, achieving GDP targets must be done or the provincial leaders will face uh, sanctions by Beijing. Um, so uh, you know, we can't think of them as, you know, some sort of a, uh, an economy that's just, just in a transition stage waiting to be a market economy. So they've had five-year plans for uh, many, many years. And now, of course, they have China 2025, which has electric vehicles on it. That will happen or people will uh, get punished. And they will, um, they will put the money uh, into that sector uh, and, and they'll, they'll reduce taxes, uh, you know, VAT taxes, or they'll reduce taxes, they'll give, you know, land, they'll give buildings, whatever, but the production targets will be met and they'll sell it somewhere for some price. Uh, that's just how it's worked in steel, it's worked in other sectors, it's how it's worked in, uh, you know, LED technology or other technology. So uh, we, we have to really not, we can't think of level playing field, they're in it to win. Um, and for our side, we need to uh, develop a, a strategy to win. Uh, they have printed more money to, uh, uh, to pump up the economy uh, than, than we've ever seen in the history of the world. In fact, uh, if you remember the, the money printing uh, debate after the Great Recession saying we're going to debase our currency, you know, uh, but yet the U.S. and the European Central Bank, ECB, and Japan printed more money than anyone thought was possible. Well, you combine all that and double it, and that's how much China prints. So the People's Bank of China prints new renminbi. They capitalize the state-owned banks, which then lend to the state-owned or state-supported enterprises, which then uh, build bridges to nowhere or unoccupied cities, 
or other uh, what we would call non-productive investments or some, you know, productive, of course, and they can't pay the loans back and the PCOB prints more remnant B, recapitalizes the state-owned banks and retires the debt of the state enterprises. So there's that and there's China's currency undervaluation, which they've done for a while, not so much now, but the dollar is about 27% overvalued, which makes it hard for us to compete. So there's Number one, we've got to have incentives to rebuild here. Number two, we've got to have a customer base. And number three, we've got to have protection from foreign predation. So that's, uh, that's what it takes, I think. That's, that's great, uh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, setting that stage. Andy, your colleague Simon Morris testified in Congress that, as I said in my opening remarks, we're in the midst of a global battery arms race in which the United States is presently a bystander. It was one of, one of those amazing slides that passed by every viewer uh, every second for like five minutes. Seeing that you, we have a technical glitch. Seeing you there, you are an expert in the mineral processing and component parts of batteries. Can you share what he meant by that and how you believe this is a threat to the US, uh, auto and truck manufacturing and maybe the industrial base um, fully? Yeah. Yeah, so since 2014, Benchmark's been tracking the build out of the global lithium ion supply chain, not just in terms of cell manufacturing, but the chemicals, cathode, anode extraction technologies. And what we've really seen with, you know, some sort of in increasing alarm is just how quickly China has grown to become the global leader and to really consolidate its position all across that supply chain. And, you know, when we started tracking this back in 2015, there were three plants planned around the world to be producing at a gigawatt hour scale. By the time you went to press on your report, it was 140. Skip forward a month and we're at 167. Um, so it, it's absolutely phenomenal how quickly the industry is building out. If we look at where the US is in comparison to, to Europe and China. By 2024, the US will have about nine of these plants in operation and be producing about 144 gigawatt hours of cells or at least have capacity to do that. By contrast, the European Union will have 16 plants at 256 gigawatt hours, so almost double that. And China will have over 100 at 1,350 gigawatt hours. So they're going to maintain that 70% part of the supply chain. And the US is on track at the moment to have about 10% of the global market share. If you're the US, you really, you know, given the size of the economy, you don't want to be 10% of anything, particularly not an industry as important as lithium ion, because it really is an enabling technology, not just for EVs, but for, for many other sectors and you know, it's, it's been, has been mentioned their national security implications from, from not being a technological leader in these, these breakthrough technologies. You mentioned the threat um, that not sort of you know, being at the forefront of this or keeping at the forefront of this could be, well, as these supply chains ramp up, as we move more and more to electric vehicles, you have to understand that your existing supply chains are ramping down. So what does that mean? It means you're having factory closures. It means you're losing jobs in the Midwest. For states such as Ohio and Georgia, who have huge automotive component um, manufacturing capabilities, those industries won't exist unless they adapt. So, you know, there needs to be a plan here because otherwise what you're doing is you are winding down a large part of your economy and effectively shipping those jobs again to China, to Asia. So there really does need to be a, you know, a bit more of a strategy and a holistic strategy as, as we've discussed before. Um, I think, you know, from, from the US to, to really seize the opportunity that, that lithium ion presents. But you said it's, it's also not just a um, EV story. That it's also a bunch of larger stories to so share that like the the larger uh maybe economic and other industries that are impacted yeah so the the obvious one is the renewable energy um, sector and energy storage systems as we say effectively this allows you to have decentralized grids which are far more secure 
it allows you to have a cleaner energy mix. If you look at what Elon Musk um, announced a couple of days ago, you know, they want Tesla to be producing 50% batteries for EVs, but 50% batteries for energy storage systems. You can also use those cells in a variety of applications, um, you know, particularly with, with industry, anything where you are effectively sometimes consuming a lot of energy and other times not so much, it makes sense to have a battery to even out the load. And there are many, many industries that will benefit from that and just being able to store energy and being able to store energy, you know, as I say, off of very expensive and vulnerable grid systems. So I think, you know, the, the key thing really for the, the way that electric vehicles are impacting, well, electric vehicles themselves, you know, they're not going to have a huge impact on climate. They're very expensive to produce. They have a very high um, carbon footprint in the manufacturing stage. But what they've done is they've massively brought down the cost of energy storage. And that has huge implications for um, both internal combustion supply chain, but also the oil and gas sector and the, the wider energy um, economy. So as I say, you know, once you have cheap energy storage, it really does open up a, a huge world of, of opportunity. So uh, Ryan, before we get to uh, China, what, what just you, you ran a, a big bus company that was trying to create an electric bus. Uh, give us some perspective on, uh, on batteries and prices and where we are and, and where the United States fits and maybe some of your frustrations in, uh, in trying to uh, build this up in the United States. Sure, I, I think this is a, this is a competition um, or a comparison between entrepreneurship and private capital markets um, and a, uh, a classic economic system versus a command economy. And so I, I think what everyone experiences outside of China um, is that you're basically pitting innovation against, um, against unlimited but often um, wastefully deployed resources. So, um, you know, I, I think my perspective, having um, been at both uh, Tesla and Proterra and invested in a number of clean energy companies, is that um, the U.S. is the world leader in terms of rapid innovation, getting to the right technology. I think um, making that technology compete um, in, a, in an open market, which gets you to, to the most... Um, the most competitive overall solution. Um, but there isn't a recognition of the scale and the capacity that needs to back that up. So I think uh, Tesla's battery day is a perfect example of the level of innovation that comes out of the private sector in the US. But immediately the question goes to, can we supply the raw materials for that new type of battery? Can even Tesla keep up with it with what will be organic demand for its cars and for its energy storage? Um, if, there was, um, if there was a way to uh, provide scaling capital to U.S. innovation, I think that um, I think it would be a significant, significant leveling of the playing field. And the last thing I'd add is while the U.S. is a very large market, fundamentally the way the EV market currently works is that U.S.-based companies compete with each other and with Chinese companies for U.S. market share, whereas Chinese companies are... Um, predominantly given a specific piece of market share. So there's sort of a protected home playing field. Um, so just structurally, no matter how good a technology company is in the US, its addressable market is smaller because it really can't realistically go into China, which is the largest market in the world for a lot of these technologies, and it faces that imported technology in its home market. Ryan, that, that's great. I guess, Michael, do you have any comments to add to either Ryan or what Andy just said about uh, this just broader competition? I think they summed it up pretty well. I, I, uh, I don't have much more to add unless you have another question, I guess. Uh, no, I, I, let, me, let me move to, uh, uh, to anyone who wants this one, but we're proposing this minerals to markets idea, this holistic approach. Maybe we'll start with Andy. You know, how important is the holistic approach? Does the United States um, need to control every aspect of this supply chain? Are there more important aspects uh, that we should be thinking about? Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are five key 
stages in lithium ion supply chain. You've got the extraction of the raw material, the chemical processing, the anode and cathode manufacture, the cell manufacture, and then the application. If you don't have the middle stages, it kind of defeats the point of having the earlier stages or even having the latter stages. And what we quite often see in lithium iron is people sort of focus a lot on the word lithium and they say, well, okay, we, we will produce lithium and then we'll produce batteries. And they miss out the middle of the supply chain. The middle of that supply chain is still in Asia. And if you don't think holistically, you're going to end up with a situation like you have with rare earths where you've opened up you know, a great resource in, in California, reopened a great resource in California, but don't have the processing. So you have to ship it to China. Now that means that China can put a 20% import export tariff on overnight. It means that they can just stop exporting or put a quota on, and they've done this in other markets before. And you know, they, you, <laughs> yeah, there, there was zero point in, in doing it. So you need to make sure that, you know, you do have every stage of, of that supply chain. Um, if you're going to avoid the, the supply chain risk and localization risks. Um, and actually, if you look at where the U S is at the moment, you know, you have the application, you have the big automotive industry, you still don't have enough cell capacity, but you know, we expect there will be more plans there's almost zero cathode capacity and there's very little planned. Um, it, was, it was great that Tesla actually announced a, a cathode plant because they are the sort of US domestic champion in this supply chain at the moment. Again, chemical processing, something that needs to be built out. And if you don't have all of that, there's actually not much point producing the lithium from a, from a national security perspective. Uh, Robbie. Uh, sorry, Brian. I, I was just going to add, I I mean, I think there's such a phenomenal opportunity for uh, a transition from a, a 20th century industry into a 21st century clean energy economy. When you think about that entire supply chain, we have analog industries and we have uh, engineering talent and uh, research talent and factory capacity. We have existing industries that basically uh, provide uh, those skill sets for the petroleum industry from extraction to refining to storage. Um, and I, I, I think we know the future of mobility is the electric drive. It is four or five times more energy efficient than an internal combustion engine. And the price of all of the components in electric vehicles has dropped below the forecasted level where we know that transition starts occurring just for economic reasons. So we know, as you've said, the, the cars of the future are going to run on digital electric powertrains, the buses, uh, the regional trucking, all these applications are gonna go uh, distributed energy with solar storing energy in batteries. So now the question is, are, are we going to use that industry to create an economic boom in the United States the way we did with petroleum and automobiles a century ago? But I, I do think we have the ability to mine, we have the ability to refine, we have a massive chemical industry, petrochemical industry, but we, we've got to think about what is it going to take to get all of those pieces of the petroleum value chain transferred into the EV value chain. So I, I guess my, my point is we have these skill sets. They're just currently deployed in the last century's industry. If I could add to that, uh, Robbie, do you mind? No, no, please. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's, there's, there's four of the big industries in any advanced economy are automotive, aerospace, defense, and uh, shipbuilding. Uh, we've lost shipbuilding mostly. Uh, we've we've deindustrialized many different sectors by uh, not paying attention and thinking the service economy was our future. But automotive is a huge employer, and uh, we really, uh, as, as Ryan said, we really need to. So we have a lot of uh, capacity that will go unutilized uh, in the automotive supply chain. And um, as Andy mentioned, the, having the, the, the different parts of the supply chain is very important. Having it global leaves you uh, vulnerable in many types of supply chains. And, and indeed, supply chains do want to local, localize. Even look at 
Silicon Valley. Um, they could be anywhere, but they tend to be in uh, that area. But uh, it is in the national interest to, uh, to spend, uh, you know, to do a whole of government, as we said, approach to preserve and to advance these supply chains. So we keep ahead in automotive, uh, we keep uh, uh, in aerospace, we keep in defense, we keep these big sectors that absorb a lot of labor, absorb a lot of capital, spin off a lot of innovation and are uh, and give birth to uh, future generations, you know, one, two, three, four future generations of industry. Once you let that industry go, you get no more industry. The future tech from that industry is gone forever. It's very hard to get it back. So it's extremely important. Let, let, let me turn to Ed, Ed for a moment, and um, we'll talk about uh, AVs and, and telecommunication networks. But wh why don't we start by um, maybe speaking about, and, and please feel free to describe uh, May Mobility if you'd like, but really describe uh, the, the combination between AVs and EVs and why these go together. As an organization, I'm, I'm commonly asked, you know, why do you care about autonomous uh, vehicles why do you care about 5g now your mission was to end oil dependence for economic and national security and so about you know driverless cars so maybe share some perspective and bring that into this conversation of uh of evs yeah I, thank you i got started building uh robo taxis and started talking to city transportation planners who i thought would be the customers and what they pointed out is that uh, cities have are, are being crushed by their own transportation systems. You can go to almost any city in the world and look out the window, and what you'll see is congestion. Congestion that's slowing down the economy, it's slowing down uh, people getting to work. Uh, not just people who wear suits, but people who you know are cooking meals and are in the service industry. And the it's the problem is so bad that in Manhattan, for example, you've got the average speed of a taxi at about 4.7 miles per hour. So, you know, it can actually be faster to get out and walk. That's how bad the roads are. And that stems from poor utilization of the, the roadway that we have. And we can't build our way out of this problem. We can't go into the middle of an urban core and double the number of lanes. So the question really comes from an economic growth perspective how do you get more value, more, how do you extract more value creation out of the road infrastructure that you've got? And the answer is not going to be taxis. It's not going to be uh, robo taxis either. It's going to be small shared vehicles that can get people where they want to go quickly, safely, and something that they're all going to like to use. Now, the challenge here is that doing this economically means they have to be autonomous. The economics just don't work to build a transportation system on that scale that can operate at that level of efficiency without those vehicles being autonomous. So we got to work uh, about four years ago building autonomous shuttles, deploying them around the country and learning how they can transform the way that people get around cities. And what this will ultimately allow us to do is to change the way cities are physically built replace those large parking structures, which are incredibly costly and, oh my god, someone's calling me. That's not cool. <laughs> it's a customer. A customer. Yeah, it's it's okay. probably a customer. All right. We're just, I just, good grief. Stop. All right. It, already makes, it, on it, here. it makes me feel like I want to wake up in the morning. So that's my alarm. <laughs> Uh, right, so, so the, the challenge ultimately comes down to how can you improve the flow of, inf flow of people and goods through cities, and it is about uh, doing it efficiently, and that requires autonomous vehicles. So, so let's talk about this EVAV nexus. Many environmental community uh, are very concerned that vehicle miles travel will go up with uh, autonomous vehicles. And, you know, w will they be EVs? Or will they be internal combustion engines that just run autonomously and create more uh, pollution? What is your view on why they will be EVs? Is it just government fiat, or is there a, is there a technical or business uh, reason for this? In your mind, as you created May Mobility. Yeah, I think there's two really great questions in there. The first one is about what happens if passenger miles go up. And I would say, in short, that's good. There's a huge latent demand to move people 
and to move goods. And if we can serve that in a way, make better use of our infrastructure to do that, that is a win. That's going to drive the economy. It's going to help businesses grow. It means more customers for restaurants. So the question is not how can we put the brakes on that? How can we get people and goods where they need to go quickly and easily safely? On the other question, which is what's the connection between AVs, autonomous vehicles, and electric vehicles? At face value, nothing. We, we built our first generations of autonomous vehicles on internal combustion engine vehicles. We've built the second generation on hybrid vehicles. But you dig a little bit deeper and the cities really care about electric vehicles. In these highly congested areas, the smog pollution uh, is, is a huge issue for them. And they want to deploy transportation systems that are going to be going to help clean the air and be perceived as, as part of the forward looking uh, view for that city. Well, thanks for uh, the answer and the uh, insight. Uh, Ryan, we just heard cities want cleaner air. I guess the one of the positive things we discovered in COVID is that by taking a lot of cars off the road, we remembered what it was like uh, to breathe. But uh, maybe electric vehicles allow us to do both, breathe and, breathe and move. So you work a lot with cities and you're trying to sell them electric buses. Maybe share uh, your perspective on uh, working with those cities. Well, we've we found that there's, there's basically universal interest at the regional level to move away from internal combustion engine systems. Um, and that's a, that's a local air quality reason primarily. And as you said, during COVID, we, um, uh, we had the opportunity to see what life was like without uh, a massive output of internal combustion engine pollution. Um, there's also, there's a synergy between um, electric vehicles and grid storage that you don't see on the internal combustion engine side. And we see this um, in particular for assets like uh, school buses. So Proterra builds buses for um, uh, for city transit systems, but it's also a drivetrain provider for partner companies like Daimler who market an electric school bus. The interesting thing about an electric school bus is when it's not being used to, to move children, it's uh, in some cases up to a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack that can store um, solar and wind energy when uh, there's excess production and there's not necessarily um, immediately available demand. So there's a there's an entire ecosystem that fits really nicely together, especially at the city level. If you have a, if you have an aspiration to get to 100% renewable energy, um, and you also want to clean up your local air, and th those systems fit really nicely together in a way that internal combustion engines don't. Um, you know, the other thing is is noise pollution. Um, internal combustion engines, we we've gotten used to them, but they are very very noisy, especially for cities. So it's just a it's a significantly higher quality of life. Um, for residents who are near a transit system. Um, and the, the energy savings, the physics of it, it can't be denied. You, um, you're moving a heavy duty vehicle in an urban environment, whether it's an autonomous vehicle um, like made mobility or it's a, it's a driven vehicle, you're moving a vehicle with about 20% of the energy you previously used. So it's a massive amount of economic productivity. So in my opening remarks, I discussed the idea that both light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles had very similar parts. And, you know, you see in China <clears throat> that they have 500,000 electric uh, buses and, uh, and here we only have a thousand and that really you can, it doesn't really matter if it's light duty or heavy duty. In fact, heavy duty might be easier to drive that whole supply chain. Um, I don't know if Andy or Ryan or and whoever wants to speak to this idea of, you know, in the United States, we've really only had a $7,500 tax credit. We've had some low note rents, but we really haven't focused on how you could use big vehicles to drive the massive amounts of, uh, of uh, batteries. So maybe, maybe share, is that, is that true? And, uh, and, and how do you see those two types of vehicle classes fitting together? Well, I definitely, at, at the component level, it's, it's definitely, True, I would agree with that 100%. The cells that are um, that are going into light duty EVs um, can be built into larger, higher voltage modules and packs for heavy duty vehicles. Um, a heavy duty vehicle uses more battery packs and just a larger amount of energy storage. So you, you don't need to incentivize as many vehicles or push as many vehicles towards EV to get the same, um, to get this, the same 
demand signal that you would on the car side. And I, I think China has demonstrated this very effectively. One of the first things they did was, um, was push or mandate the electrification of heavy duty buses um, and also taxis in cities. So it, it, it provided a tremendous amount of uh, early infrastructure and demand for uh, cells. On the motor side, I think it's, it's similar, although um, you, I think you are starting to see heavy duty vehicles with their own bespoke drivetrains, which, which makes a lot of sense. And the last thing I'd point out is the charging networks. To, the charging networks can be the same, which I think is really, um, really interesting. And in that you could use uh, truck routes, bus routes, school bus routes to basically seed a lot of the charging infrastructure. And today we actually saw a great example of um, U.S. entrepreneurship and private capital with ChargePoint, U.S. company, one of the largest public charging networks in the world. They were, I think, they're the tenth. Auto tech IPO or merger this year. So just a demonstration of uh, the innovation and the private sector interest in the US for EV. One one thing I'd just add to, to Ryan's comments is that you know these are industries that are growing or you know, doubling every couple of years at the moment. It's really important to build out an entire ecosystem and get the scale that you need. And to do that, you know, subsidizing particularly the, the urban transport systems is important, but it's also really, you know, when you look at the scale of this, um, it is about the light vehicle market just in terms of scale. And the more that you build that out, the greater number of component manufacturers you have for you know, people like Ryan who are sourcing materials, you know, it means that you can have rather than two suppliers, you can have 10 suppliers, which will itself drive innovation and drive costs down. So it is really important just to have all of this happening at once because of the growth rate that we're seeing. And, you know, you need to invest into that growth rate. Anyone else want to add anything? I, I remind people that we have uh, recommended, uh, you know, plus and up low, no grants for the Metro systems for public fleets using our money more, uh, more smartly, as well as incentives for the first time for medium and heavy duty vehicles from the federal level. So it's something we really have, have seen has been a missing element of the U.S. Uh, strategy. I guess my next question is, okay, we hear how amazing this is. Like, I want two of those. I don't want one of those. And yet we don't do that in this country. So maybe we start with Michael, which is, you know, industrial strategy. It feels like when we say minerals to markets, you go in there uh, to Republicans and they say, I don't want that. Uh, you know, the free market's going to figure this one out. And then we go to, you know, Democrats and, um, you know, they don't, they, they don't think about the minerals or it's something that they, they see as an anathema to them. I guess my question is, have you seen a change uh, with this China question to the embracing of industrial strategy? And, uh, and how do you, and how have you, I guess, uh, been working uh, Congress and, uh, and the administration? Sure. Yeah, there's been a really big change. Uh, the wonks in Washington call it the, the Washington consensus, which is that, uh, you know, that was just, you You just have to, it's a neoliberal efficiency free trade model. And that's uh, uh, that, you know, whoever God grants the comparative advantage to will win. And uh, certainly after, you know, 1989, which uh, the Berlin Wall felt was the end of history, you know, history had shown that uh, democratic capitalism was the the model that uh, that had won, and of course, when China joined the WTO, and it's this week is a 20-year anniversary of the vote of China permanent normalized trade trade relations status. Um, you know, China was going to liberalize, as was said before. They were going to become more open, more democratic, more capitalistic, and uh, instead, they have doubled down in, in uh, socialism in a market-driven economy with Chinese characteristics. They've moved us to a multipolar world, which is a way station to, uh, in their 100-year marathon approach, a, a unipolar world with China on top by 2049, according to Michael Pillsbury, uh, the diplomat that, uh, that was around and supported Nixon's reopening to China. So we have to, so industrial strategy, the, the, a lot of senators, a lot of congressmen, a lot of leaders are now seeing that, you know, the China approach is really works really well. And if you look back to the US with Hamilton, Hamilton with his uh, 1789 report on manufacturers, we had our own strategy with tariffs 
subsidies, industrial strategy that made us the biggest economy in the world instead of an agrarian co uh, colony serving in uh, the other industrial powers by 1870. Germany did it uh, in, under Frederick List's guidance. Japan did it. Uh, the East Asian economies did it also with currency misalignment with industrial strategy, and now China's doing it. So if you see in the history of world development, there's no country that's gone from poor to rich under a kind of a laissez-faire free market system. They've all used industrial strategy, and China is the most recent one. And so we're seeing uh, on the right, uh, the, the Republicans have a, her you know, a recent heritage of sort of a jet camp, free markets, free trade, and freedom. And that's giving way to, wow, China's kicking our butt and we see what's coming out with intelligence and how they are determined uh, to win and not to go by the rules, but to bend Western institutions to their, uh, to their will. And so you see Marco Rubio, uh, Josh Hawley, uh, Senator Cotton, uh, and some others that are taking a more assertive industrial strategy view. And uh, uh, Rubio's pushing that in his perch as the chairman of the Small Business uh, Committee. Seeing it on the Democratic side as well, of course, Trump has shaken everything up because he's a, the change agent on trade and is using U.S. leverage where people didn't think it existed. Uh, and, uh, and China has reacted badly, and President Xi has really revealed his own China first uh, mentality. So, the, the, and, and we just saw yesterday or two days ago, the House of Representatives, by a vote of 406 to 3, um, vote to prevent uh, uh, any products made in whole or in part from Xinjiang province, which is where the Uyghur concentration camps are, from coming into the U.S. So it was amazing bipartisan consensus to fully prohibit items coming from uh, a region of China with humanitarian abuses. So the increasing recognition that China is not just another competitor, uh, and it's even more than game of great powers, but uh, there's, you know, being a genocidal dictatorship is just a different category. So we're seeing bipartisan change uh, with regard to the China relationship. No matter who wins in November, you know, there will be differences in policy between Trump and Biden, but a lot of these bells will not be unrung. Does anyone else uh, want to add something? I would add that one of the, the best competitive advantages that we have in the United States is our educational system. That's a place where the federal government has played a large role in making investments. And uh, that's a place we should continue to invest because that will help us win not only today's technological battles, but also tomorrow's. So, Ed, while, while, we're, while we're talking, um, maybe share some perspective on uh, the technology of, of AVs, of autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, your fears about IP theft, um, you know, we hear a lot about that, the importance of uh, 5G networks uh, to privacy, and, you know, why we need to worry about that, not just about, you know, where the batteries, the minerals, and the components for uh, EVs come from. Yeah, so control of supply chain in, a, in an AV where, where we want to make sure that there aren't security vulnerabilities anywhere is, is hugely important. Um, one of the things that we, we've spoken before about was 5G and the role that that plays with autonomous vehicles. And that's actually really interesting as well. It's a little bit like internal combustion engines in the sense that uh, you don't inherently need 5G to build an autonomous car. But when you start to think about the transformation of cities that we need in order to continue to, the, to, continue to grow in these dense areas, we need to extract more and more efficiency out of those transportation systems. And that's going to require careful coordination of many cars from many different manufacturers, uh, scheduling, routing, passenger pickups, drop-offs. And 5G can be a, an important part of that. You know, Ed, when I'm talking about this, do you think that autonomy can accelerate EVs? Like we, we have talked a lot about this idea, like, you know, e EVs are driving, which is what we all know. You know, AVs are a different value proposition. And yes, it's difficult, but once it gets out there, do you see that uh, maybe it's not EVs uh, lead their own revolution, but AVs help uh, bring the uh, EV revolution along? Because people maybe actually leave their assets, don't use the cars they have. Because like what we saw with shared cars, we saw it with Uber and Lyft. How many people left their cars uh, in their driveways because it was actually more convenient, cheaper, and everything else? So how do you see that interrelationship between speed of EVs based on AVs? 
Well, I think AVs are likely to be the laggards here in that the technology has a lot of a lot of a lot of way, long way to go in order to fully penetrate the market. And so for at least the next few years, you're likely to see AVs in relatively small quantities, uh, probably not driving the EV industry. However, in that longer term future, the relationship between AVs and EVs becomes more important. Uh, the, 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 I see that the most likely deployment of AVs is going to be as managed fleets as opposed to individually owned vehicles. And that creates a huge amount of sensitivity to total cost of ownership reliability, maintainability, the number of parts, and driving the asset utilization as high as you can in order to recover, uh, to be able to pay off the, the high capital costs of that AV and EV system. So I think at the end of the day, AVs and EVs will complement each other. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ed, for that perspective. Andy, you're uh, sitting over there in uh, London. Uh, and uh, maybe bring it to that side of the pond, not over the Pacific, but over the Atlantic. And where do you see the United States stacked up against uh, Europe? And, uh, and, and what has Europe done right? And maybe what can the United States learn? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think there is a difference when, when I'm talking to people in the EU Commission, they, they have a strategy. They know what they want to achieve from a political basis. From a political standpoint, they don't want to be reliant on China for that part of the supply chain. They want to create as many jobs as possible, and they've actually created their own competition. Like you know, the, the number of regions of Europe that get in touch with me now, wanting to set up a battery hub, um, is is phenomenal. And you know, that's accelerated over the course of this year since the pandemic as there has been you know, more stimulus money coming into to Europe, which is focusing on, on building back different, um, building back greener. And you know, that is, is, I think, a, an onus that you have in Europe, that, um, and a sense of urgency that you have in Europe that perhaps we don't currently have in, uh, in the US. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that even if you have that political strategy you know, this isn't China where the government will mandate things. It, in Europe, it is still the corporates which have to put this into, pl into play. And it's still the corporates in the US that are going to put this into play. And I think the, the corporates in the US are now catching up in terms of at least their thinking and their supply chain investment. And, you know, you've seen, um, for example, General Motors have the um, joint venture with LG Chem in, in Lordstown, Ohio. You're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to start seeing a lot more of the automotive companies start investing in the supply chain. But what would be good is to have a bit more of a coherent federal strategy or plan. And, you know, the sort of almost a, a one point of contact, which the, the EU do have. And I'd also say that, you know, Europe, they're, they're slightly ahead in terms of offering financial support. Um, in terms of things like non-recourse debt capital and soft financing. Well, well, well you know what they say, uh, once the United States finally wakes up, we do things in big ways. It took us how long to, to, to help in World War II? So we'll get there. Uh, we're just trying to accelerate it from the uh, safe uh, ESLC perspective. I'm Ryan. You were in the military. You and I found common cause over the messaging of, uh, of national security, uh, oil dependence, and and have talked about you know the politics of climate change. I, I guess why do you think this got stuck, and can we unstick it? Wow, yeah, that's a that's a that's a big one. Um, I mean, I think the primary reason that it, that it got stuck in the U.S. is for all the for all the wonderful benefits of of the private sector and the efficient allocation of resources, the fact that we have private, privately owned uh, fossil fuel producing companies, I think is the reason why there has been so much political friction in terms of dealing with pollution and, um, and climate change. Um, if you look at, you, you have countries in Europe, you know, as Andy mentioned, that are they're farther ahead in, in thinking about solving this problem. And some of those countries produce a lot of oil but there's, um, there's more of, I think, a, a stakeholder analysis 
or a sustainability view in terms of how they, they view their fossil fuel sector, whereas our fossil fuel sector in the US, um, our, our system still primarily operates um, to the basically measuring decisions based on shareholder financial value only. And if you're a public company, that's next quarter's public results. So I, I try to say that without any sort of judgment or, um, or, or kind of moralism to it. It's just, it is, the, it is a fact that we have had very large profitable companies that just mathematically are incentivized to ensure that we don't regulate fossil fuels too soon. I think the risk that we have is that if China succeeds in scaling the energy economy of the 21st century, that regardless of, um, I think, how controversial some elements of, um, of the Chinese production system are, they're going to have a they're going to have a moral authority to enter a lot of markets, especially if those markets are interested in bending the curve on CO2. So I you know I think that the recipe is solar batteries EVs that results in the lowest cost per mile, lowest cost per unit of energy, zero local pollution, and low CO2. Um, in the U.S., I, I think this is the first year that things have really gotten local and acute in terms of climate change. And I, I hope that leads to better policy. And, um, you know, I think in the West, it's the example is the wildfires. Um, and those are, those have burned blue and red states and are pretty frightening to see at a local level. And in the East, we have, we have storms and hurricanes and flooding that are just unprecedented. This year we're, we're on to, I think the Greek alphabet in naming new storms that are coming out of the Atlantic. So we've used up all of the, uh, all of the, the, the English names for storms. Um, so I, you know, as you said, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the U.S. will will be late, but answer in a big way. Um, but we we're we're going to have to acknowledge that climate change is a real problem, and that if China solves that problem with an industrial system, that's going to be a highly exportable set of products, even into the U.S. Okay, this is my last question, and everyone, please be brief for whoever wants to answer, which is. You know, if we wanted to maintain some autonomy over this supply chain, either EV, AV, 5G, what would you do? What is the most important thing to do? Um, try to be a minute, maybe just provide one or two thoughts. Why, why don't we start with uh, Andy? Um, I'd actually go back to something that, that Michael said in terms of, you know, you can't just rely on the market without having you know, without pushing them, without having that type of industrial strategy framework. Um, and I think, you know, for the US, having that coherent plan and then utilizing the strength of industry to um, implement that and expedite that is, is probably the way ahead. Michael, you were just uh, mentioned, not in vain, but you can now say, what would you, what would you do? Sure, you need, you need incentives to build. Uh, you figure out what those incentives are. Uh, to make the difference uh, here to build or to reshore, number, uh, number uh, one. Number two, you need an immediate customer base that you can get to scale. Uh, in some cases, that means uh, government procurement by American. And uh, number three, you need uh, protection from foreign predation. So the biggest foreign subsidizer of the day doesn't come in and take you out uh, forever. And that may be tariffs or quotas. And overarching, we've seen from the last 30, 40 years, you need a currency that's not overvalued. You need to re realign the dollar by about 27%. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Okay, Ed, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most of our customers in the transportation space are cities, but their funding comes from federal government, uh, at least in significant part. So the federal government plays a really large role in directing dollars to competitively bid projects that companies like May or Proterra can bid for. Uh, so I think that's a really important role. Uh, Ryan, take us home. Bring well, I'm a big fan of demand side. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of demand side incentives because you can, you, you still allow competition. So I think that um, in the US, what you could do is combine demand side incentives, which would mean EV tax credits, programs like LONO, funding for, for large fleets like UPS, FedEx, DHL to move over to EV, but then also combine those dem demand side incentives with local content. So you still have a free market, you still have competition, 
um, but you, you set a local content requirement similar to Buy America for those incentives, whether they're for cars or trucks or buses to be utilized. Excellent. Thank you all of you for sharing your insights today. You all have an amazing perspective um, on, this, on this issue and we look forward to keeping in touch. And thanks for everything uh, you've done uh, for educating everyone on this and I appreciate it.